to make clear how this works from my point of view, um, our first conclusion is simply that early adoption brings about very good outcomes for children. Okay? There will be some people for whom this conclusion touches a nerve, uh, perhaps because it evokes particular adoption practices, maybe historical ones, that have been widely condemned, like forced adoption, and this response is understandable. In reaching our conclusion, however, we've simply sampled the impressive contemporary research literature that compares certain measurable outcomes for children who have been adopted with children who have not been adopted, or compares children who have been adopted early with those who have been adopted late. Now, the vast majority of these data are derived from industrialised Western countries and so are somewhat comparable to our own circumstances. What's most impressive about these data is their uniformity. Across different countries, independent research groups have reached broadly similar conclusions many times over with different children. In terms of widely accepted indices of developmental outcome, which includes physical growth, attachment and emotional self-regulation, cognitive development, social integration and edu educational performance, adopted children do better than their non-adopted counterparts and early adoption, adoption yields better outcomes than late adoption. Now, obviously, adoption is not a topic about which we can conduct genuine experimental research, which provides a very high standard of evidence. Nevertheless, the fact that so many independent research groups reach broadly similar conclusions allows us to largely eliminate certain kinds of doubts that we might ordinarily have about social science uh, research findings. The principles of independence, so that is independence of the samples and the researchers, and the principle of replication across different contexts tell us that these conclusions are really very robust. So I present you with a quotation from two of the most distinguished developmental uh, scientists in the world, Marius van Isendoorn and Femi Jufa. So in a landmark uh, presentation uh, and publication for the, the um, Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry, they present a major meta-analysis of research on the relation between, between adoption and child outcomes. The meta-analytic methodology, it's not perfect, allows researchers to gather research from many sources and to continue, con consider them simultaneously. Okay, and they conclude we found, and this is the quotation, we found a linear relation between time spent in an institutional setting and a lag in physical growth. So first they're considering children who've come from the sort of Romanian context, institutionalised children. And not only there, by the way, indicating that children from orphanages need to have, um, indeed have been negatively affected in a dose response manner by pre-adoption period. So that, that what they're saying is the longer you're in the institution, the worse it is, right? But we also found that domestic as well as international adoptions are effective interventions in the developmental domains of physical growth, attachment security, cognitive development, school achievement, self-esteem and behaviour problems. The meta-analytic evidence for this finding is enormous based on hundreds of adoption studies on thousands of children and their families. Now a response to our conclusion and the conclusion presented I think most articulately by Van Isendorn and Ufa. Um, might be that when considering adoption, each case needs to be considered on its merits and that the conditions specific to New South Wales don't generalise to these broad findings. And I hear that sort of argument all the time. But this is to miss the point. That is to completely miss the point. The existing research literature strongly implies a principle that does generalise across settings. Furthermore, if we consider the New South Wales context and the children to the focus of this research at the pointy end of the triangle, right, of the pyramid, the conclusions presented here should very much apply to them because they're coming out of quite challenging circumstances. The, the more maltreatment, the more neglect there is, the more these conclusions hold up. It's a very strong relation. Okay, so these research findings that speak to the benefits of adoption are strongest for precisely the sorts of children that we're, that we're focusing on in this report. So for these reasons, we recommended that the benefits of early adoption should be accepted as a guiding principle in making decisions in the best interests of children for whom restoration or kin care is not possible. It doesn't mean it's, it's, it should be a fait accompli. It should be accepted as a principle. So against that, we can argue and think and bring our professional and practice-based expertise to consider what might be right for this particular child. But the starting point, you should, you should feel confident in the starting point that 
adoption for a young child removed from family and who's not able to be in king care in the New South Wales context is a good candidate for adoption. So if we compare the possibilities outlined above, it's clear to me at least that adoption is more stable than fostering and furthermore, at least insofar as we can gather any evidence internationally or in Australia, uh, and furthermore, being adopted is highly valued by the young people who we spoke with. So we did interview adoptees um, and, and they were very articulate about the value of adoption to them. So it may ultimately turn out to be true that permanent fostering can in principle achieve some of the same outcomes as adoption, but pragmatically speaking, this is not generally true in our context, and I struggle to see how it could be true without some very radical changes in our practices and expectations. If not easily within our own choice, however, to overlook the importance of identity for well-being is a folly, and this is nowhere more self-evident evident than in the case of adoption. We're all familiar with the need that many adoptees experience to have access to knowledge of their biological and genealogical origins, to meet their birth parents and to reconstruct their personal story. That's not to say every single person has that need, but for many people it's a very strong need. We're also probably familiar with the catastrophic effects that can be experienced by some adoptees when they learn later in life that they've been adopted. To discover you are adopted as an adult or an adolescent can imply a profound violation of trust and can set in motion a compelling search for one's identity. It is precisely, precisely for these kinds of reasons that open adoption has become a uh, standard in many countries, including Australia. And whilst there's little consensus on how, I'm oh, going to hear more about open adoption today, I'm glad to hear, but, but while there's little consensus on how open adoption should be implemented or how exactly it best serves the interests of the child, there's nonetheless consensus that children should have access to their biological family because of identity needs. Um, so when viewed from a distance, and I'll just reflect on that a bit more in a second, but when viewed from a distance, the findings of our working paper regarding the identity implications for children are remarkably simple. The testimony of these individuals quite plainly shows that they have a strong and positive identities as adopted persons. They feel that they own this aspect of themselves, and we found no evidence in this group of regret or shame at having been adopted. Quite the contrary, the overwhelming sense was that they felt tre uh, treasured by their adoptive parents, something that all children should be allowed to feel and something that contributes in a profound way to healthy identity formation and to felt security. 